Let's open our Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 8, and we're going to pick up where we left off, Acts, chapter 8. Uh, those of you that have been continuing the study with us, you know that we had got halfway through and we felt that it would be a good place to cut it. Uh, kind of bring you up to par. Chapter 8 starts out with Saul uh, persecuting the church. The Bible, say he was, Bible says he was consenting unto Stephen's death and he started a great persecution against the church. And for those of you that may not be a, a Bible student and you're just now learning, you know, Saul uh, was a constable in the Sanhedrin Council. Uh, and this terrible, horrible Saul uh, became the great apostle Paul. And when I read things like this and see things like this in the study of the book of Acts, it just screams to me the power of God. You know, like the worship team was just saying, our God is an awesome God. And he's full of power and he's full of might. And it's a shame uh, if we don't, as Christians, recognize the power uh, that the Bible wants us to have clearly documented in this holy writing. I don't know about y'all, but I want all the power of God I can get. Amen? And you know, to bring you up to par, and those of you that may be just joining us, uh, you can go back on this same link uh, to the Wednesday nights back from this date, and you can find where we started in Acts chapter 1, and you can study with us. You can watch these during the day, and then every Wednesday night jump in here, and you'll catch up in no time. But I want to remind everybody and reminisce on what we've learned. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus promises his infant born-again church great dynamite power to be his witnesses. And John the Baptist, remember him? John the Baptist, when they asked him if he was the Christ, he said, no, I'm not the Christ. He said, I indeed baptize with water under repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And Acts chapter 1, Jesus plainly tells the church, go tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And you know the disciples ask him, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, hey, that's not for you to know. You let God handle the kingdom. He said, you wait on and receive the power I'm going to give you to build the kingdom. In Acts chapter 2, I know everybody, I hope, in this sanctuary has read and studied that chapter. In Acts chapter 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled. They were all filled with that power Jesus promised in Acts 1. He also promised us this power in Acts, I mean, John 14. Think about that. They received the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And a lot of times, and I say this, I, I say this humbly and I say it in love, a lot of times even in a Pentecostal church, they kind of think that well, the speaking in the tongues is the power. Look, speaking in tongues is the first evidence the power is ever present with us. And the power is given not just to speak in tongues, but to perform the mighty works of God to build his kingdom because Jesus is coming for it. Amen. And every Christian needs to receive their gift of the Holy Ghost. You know, Acts 3, Acts 2 and 3, thousands are being saved. Uh, Acts 4, we see, you know, the mighty power of God working. Acts 5, uh, we see uh, Ananias and Sapphira <laughs> struck dead by this power. Are you listening to me? And when you receive the Holy Ghost, 
you get the power of God, and God don't want you to contain that power and just be a vessel of it. He wants you to be an outlet of His power. That power God gives you, He wants you to practice, amen, practice that power in the authority of Jesus' name. And of course, we go and we've learned here in the seventh chapter that Stephen was out there preaching under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and he became the first martyr of the church. And in his death, the power in him enabled him to look into heaven and see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. He couldn't have done that except by the power of the Holy Spirit that was in him. Now, in Acts chapter 8, last Wednesday night, uh, we, we, we read about a guy named Simon, and uh, he was a sorcerer. Look in verse 9. He bewitched the people of Samaria. And the Bible says he had them all deceived uh, because they all gave heed uh, to him in verse 10 from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. Watch this. This was just black magic. But when the disciples came into Samaria with the gift of the Holy Ghost, when Philip got there preaching under the anointing of the Holy Ghost and began to lay hands on people that were sick and lame and crippled and blind, can I get a witness? When he was casting out devils, then everybody then knew that there was a greater power than, the, than this sorcerer. There was the power of God present in common man. Listen to me carefully. Every born-again Christian needs to go on and receive their gift of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when you receive that gift, God don't want you just to hold it. He wants you to go out there and use it. He wants you to give it away. <laughs> Hallelujah. He wants you to cast out devils. Lay, lay your hands on sick folk. Somebody say amen. He wants you to speak life over, over your uh, possessions. He wants you uh, to speak prosperity to come to you from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Are you, are you saying, Brother Harris, that, that God's given me this power for me uh, to be blessed? Yes. Yes. Ultimately, primarily, to lift up Jesus. But you can't lift up Jesus until you pick your own self up and become the Christian God wants you to be. Amen. I want you to see in, in, in Acts chapter 8, under great persecution of Saul, the disciples went everywhere preaching Jesus and ministering grace, hallelujah, to sinners. And I want to tell you something. If they could do it back then, you and I can do it today. If they could bind the devil back then, Brother Herbert, then you and I can bind Satan out of our lives tonight. Hallelujah. And tomorrow and next week. And next month, I think we got a good introduction. God anoint this. I already feel your power. God, let your power be released in this Bible study. Help us, God, to learn and study to show ourselves approved workmen that needeth not to be ashamed. In Jesus' name, and the group said amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Do you have that baptismal power to lift up Jesus. Look in verse 12. The Bible says the people of Samaria, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, underline that, and the name of Jesus Christ. You're not doing no preaching if you're not lifting up Jesus. You're not doing no teaching if you're not lifting up Jesus. You're not doing no singing if you're not lifting up Jesus Christ. He's what it's all about. I said, Jesus is what it's all about. The Bible says when they heard the gospel of Jesus, that God had become flesh, that he had lived a perfect life on earth 33 and a half years, when these people of Samaria, when they heard that Jesus had went to the cross and died for their sins and was buried and raised up from the dead, they believed him, hallelujah. They accepted him as their personal savior. The Bible says they were baptized both men and women. And even the old sorcerer, when he saw the miracles that the apostles were doing in Jesus' name, look there in the 13th verse. 
not only the Samarians, but that old sorcerer, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. Let's stop here just a moment. Who has told the church that signs and miracles is not for today? I hear a lot of preachers saying, oh, this ain't for today. Well, show me that in the Bible. Show me that in the Scripture uh, that God has stopped demonstrating signs, wonders, and miracles. Let me tell you the truth that with joy that's unspeakable. Holy Ghost filled Christians, uh, hallelujah, we can lay hands on the sick and God will heal them. God still heals, heals cancer. He can heal the blind. Can I get a witness? He can heal your marriage. Lord have mercy, I come to teach, but I feel like preaching again. God's power has not diminished one, one iota. The problem is, is faithless believers. Amen. Listen to me. The Holy Ghost that we receive today is the same Holy Ghost they were operating under here in Acts chapter 8. Philip went in there preaching Jesus. Can I tell you about Jesus? He would draw a crowd. Anybody here sick today? And I'm sure folks raised their hand like they do here today. And when they did, he would say, come here. They would walk up to him, he would lay his hand on their head and say in the name of Jesus and by the authority of Jesus' name, be healed. And you know what? The Holy Ghost, God the Holy Ghost, would heal those people so they would believe that Jesus is the Christ. That's the whole purpose of the coming of the Holy Ghost in baptismal form is to prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Messiah of the world, the Lamb of God. Hallelujah! And we are to be willing as Christians to be vessels, hallelujah, of this power of God and practice Christianity biblical style. Somebody say amen. You know, I'm going to say this with all the love I can. Hallelujah. If you're in a church and people are coming in there sick and, and lost and hypocrite and backslid and, and, and bogged down with depression and anxiety and your pastor don't offer the spiritual power of God for victory, get out of there. Get out of there and go to a church that preaches the full gospel. I'm going to tell you something. God ain't lost no power. He's the same today he was yesterday. And God is the same tomorrow that he is today. He never changes. Hallelujah. God gives believers the gift of the Holy Ghost so that we can go out and represent Jesus to our world. Do y'all see the early church doing that here? Under great persecution... They were going out preaching and teaching Jesus and confirming His resurrection with signs, miracles, and wonders. Mm -mm -mm. Lord, have mercy. If you're sick and you live in the Birmingham Metroplex, if you're devil-possessed and you live in the Birmingham Metroplex, <laughs> if you're suffering from great depression or any kind of anxiety, if you need a, a miracle move of God in your life, come to Grace Temple. If you're not within driving or flying distance, <laughs> hallelujah, write me a letter. I'll lay hands on it and send it back to you and the power of God will set you free if you're watching me in China, if you're watching me in Mongolia, if you're watching me in Moscow. The power of God is ever present. Hallelujah! The Spirit indeed is willing. It's our flesh that gets weak. If you need deliverance, Jesus will set you free. He said, Brother Harris, do you really believe that? <laughs> Absolutely! Absolutely. Here they were going in every street, in every city, everywhere they could get a crowd to draw. They were preaching Jesus and performing miracles in Jesus' name. Now, now watch this in verse 14. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, that means they had gotten saved, they sent unto them Peter and John who, when they were come down, prayed for them. Watch this. Not that they get saved. They already received Jesus. 
They prayed for them that they might receive, here it is, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, listen to me carefully. The Holy Ghost is a gift from Jesus to a saved person. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of y'all got it wrong out here. You don't get the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost when you get born again. When you get born again, you receive salvation. When you get the gift of the Holy Ghost, you receive the power and the anointing from Jesus to do the works of the ministry. And you're really not fit, amen, to go out and win the world until you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. My brother Harris, where you get the authority to say that? Acts 1, <laughs> Acts 1, Jesus said so. He said, go be my witnesses. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Amen. Terry in Jerusalem, stay there. Don't leave there until you receive this power from on high. Amen. And they were smart enough not to even attempt ministry. That's why they tarried in Jerusalem. Acts 2, <laughs> when they got the Holy Ghost, there they went. And nothing could stop them. The Roman army couldn't stop them. They killed some of them. They persecuted the church. The mighty Jewish Sanhedrin council couldn't stop them. They killed a few. They arrested a bunch. But guess what? Here they are going everywhere, multiplying, hallelujah, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. This mighty Holy Ghost is power that the world cannot resist. It's a power that Satan cannot resist. It's a power that makes demons tremble. Hallelujah. It's a power that will make sickness fall off of you. Hallelujah. It's a power that will convict your loved ones and draw them to an old rugged cross. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I did started preaching. It breaks my heart to see good meaning. I'm talking about good Christians living without this baptismal gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You're robbing yourself and you're robbing God. I'm so glad they all received the Holy Ghost. Here it is. Watch verse 16. For as yet He was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. I mean, it's right there, folks. Amen. You can be born again in water baptized and not have the Holy Ghost. And that was the condition of them. So they sent for Peter and John to come down and pray for them that they might receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And of course, Peter and John did. Look in verse 17. Then laid they their hands on them. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then they... Peter and John laid their hands on them. And guess what happened? They received uh, the Holy Ghost. How do you get this Holy Ghost? Go to somebody that's got it and they can lay hands on you. And if you'll believe the Word of God and if you'll be humble, God will fill you with the gift of Holy Ghost power so that you can be a dynamic witness for Jesus Christ all the days of your life. Remember, remember the sorcerer? And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered money. Hey, let me buy that. Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased. <laughs> Here it is. Now, so this Holy Ghost is called what? The gift of God. With money. Peter said, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. In other words, he said, man, you ain't got no business coming up, coming up in this church service. 
blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Your heart ain't right before God. Look at there. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now, here's where we left off and we're going to pick up. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip. I want you to watch this now. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that thou goest down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now, in the news today, we're hearing a whole lot about the Gaza Strip. Same place. Notice here, because Philip had the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, I don't want you to go back to Jerusalem with Peter and John. I want you to go down to a desert place. Amen. See, folks, why we need the baptism of the Holy Ghost? If Philip had not been under the leading of the Holy Spirit, a great man would not have been contacted and saved and set forth in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a whole sermon this, this one guy we're fixing to read about. He went on after his experience with Philip and, and the Holy Ghost and done a great work for God that lasts to this day. But get a load of this. Revival's over in Samaria. Church leaders pack up and head back to Jerusalem. But the Holy Spirit and Philip says, hey, you go down to the desert. But down, go down from Jerusalem down into Gaza. Watch what happens here. And he arose and went. Verse 27. And behold, a man, an Ethiopian, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship. He was returning and sitting in his chariot and read Isaiah the prophet. Amen. Then the Spirit, here it is again, said unto Philip, go near. And join thyself to this chariot. Do y'all understand that this guy more than likely had bodyguards? Do y'all understand that this was a dignitary, this was the secretary of state from Ethiopia. He was the treasurer of the queen's uh, jewels and gold and all her wealth. Amen. But the Holy Spirit told Philip, I want you to go up to the chariot and I want you to introduce yourself. Listen, folks, that's what's wrong with a lot of our witnessing. We're doing it in the flesh or we're doing it through emotion, and we're not doing it by being led of the Holy Spirit. Do y'all see here that God the Holy Ghost in Philip is speaking to him and directing him who to go to to witness? Somebody asked me one time, Brother Harris, how are you so successful in, in getting all these people saved? And It's easy. The Holy Spirit will tell you, this, this is a good guy. This guy will listen, this guy won't. Somebody say, Amen. This guy needs me. This guy's not ready. And it's not just for the preachers. It's for every believer can be led by the Spirit. I mean, you just didn't go up to this guy's chariot. But Philip had no choice because the Holy Spirit told him to go join himself to this man. What, what's this? And Philip ran thither to him. And when God does lead us to do something for him, we don't need to drag our feet. We need to run and do it. 
and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understand thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I? Except some man should guide me. And can I stop right here just a moment and do a little teaching? How will the sinner ever know? How, how will the lost man ever truly, really understand the things of God if we're not spirit-filled and spirit-led and willing to go tell them what thus saith the Lord? The prophet said, the apostle said, how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach except they be sent? And then the scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel. That means that when Christians get full of the Holy Spirit and full of God's love and compassion for our world and we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us into paths of contact with the lost and dying, those Jesus died for, God looks at us and says, oh, what beautiful feet they have. Look at my child going for me. Look at my child serving me. You won't get God's blessings all over you. You start being led by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> now, he'll take you into some wild situations. I'm here to tell you, you know, we read over there in 7 that he led Stephen, what? Into death. But he really led him into death under eternal life. I mean, you, you know, how, how can you understand except somebody teach you? I mean, don't, don't dwell on, on the downside here. Philip's sitting in heaven waiting on us to get there. I mean, Stephen, hallelujah. Now, now watch this. The Bible says, and he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And here's how you know that the Spirit has led you to somebody. They'll be open and receptive. 99.9% of the time, they won't cuss you out. They won't slam the door in your face. If you go in the right spirit, they'll hear you. If you'll go in the right spirit, being led of the Spirit, God will already have their heart crumbled, waiting on you to deliver that seed of salvation. Watch this. Watch this. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. Ooh, I could preach that text. Hallelujah. And like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so opened he not his mouth. Let me interpret that in case how could you know without, without somebody teaching you. He's talking about Jesus, the Lamb of God. That could have resisted death, but he shut his mouth. He took the pain. He took the shame. He took the ignominy. Are you listening to me? He went to the cross and lovingly, caringly died for you. And died for me. And died for the whole world. And didn't open his mouth. He could have called down 12 legion of angels. He could have cried out, Father! Get me down from here. And I know the Father turned his head, but if Jesus had said that, the Father would have annihilated this universe. But he was determined. Jesus was determined to pay your sin debt in full. He was determined that you wouldn't die and go to hell. Jesus was determined that you would be saved and live with God for all time and eternity. Woo! Do y'all feel what I feel? It's that power. It's that same power. He read on, in his humi humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee. Can, let, me, let me bring that up to modern day terminology. I beg you, man, please tell me. Tell me what this means. Of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? And I'm here to tell you, Philip's mouth got to go in under the anointing. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture, and here it is, and preached 
unto him Jesus. I told you, I told you, hallelujah, nowhere, no matter where you start in this Bible right here, no matter where you get, you can go over there in Genesis 1. Hallelujah. If you'll start following it, it'll lead you to Jesus. It'll lead you to a cross. It'll lead you to a grave. It'll lead you to an empty grave. It'll lead you, hallelujah, to a resurrected Christ. It will lead you to an ascended Jesus at the right hand of the Father. It will lead you to salvation. It will tell you about the blood will tell you about the sacrifice. Hallelujah. That's what Holy Ghost filled people do. Listen to me, those of you that are being bewitched on television. These evangelists are telling you, send me this money and I'll pray over this and, and God will send you a thousand dollars. Quit giving them your money. The Holy Ghost is not to profit a man. Are you listening to me? It's not for self-exaltation. It's for Jesus' exaltation. Put your money in a local church. Support a pastor that's preaching the truth. Amen. Philip preached unto him Jesus. Verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. Y'all see what happened here. Philip was just a, a common evangelist preaching to the Samaritans. <laughs> the cities of Samaria, not even a Christian Jew wanted to go there. <laughs> but Philip was led by the Spirit. Are you listening to me? Then he was led down to Gaza. Then he saw a, a eunuch, a treasure of the Queen of Ethiopia. <laughs> And, and Philip should have stayed way away from that chariot, but the Holy Spirit said, go. Now he's riding with the guy. <laughs> now he's riding with this dignitary. Are you listening to me? What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying, if you'll get the Holy Ghost and let him lead you, he'll take you out of the gutter. Uh, hello, somebody. And he'll make you somebody going somewhere. He will give you connections for the glory of Jesus Christ. Somebody receive that word. That's a word to somebody that will receive it. Some of you sit here letting it just fly all by. Blessing just floating all over your head, did you? <laughs> Phillip's up there riding with this guy. That's the same thing as getting on a jet with Hillary Clinton and going somewhere. Wouldn't it be nice if a spirit-filled preacher got on a plane with Hillary and got her saved? It could be done. Phillips riding with him and the eunuch said, Hey, there's some water. Do y'all realize by the eunuch saying, There's some water, that Philip has told him the whole plan of the gospel? Starting in Isaiah, he shared the whole gospel plan. This guy knew how to get saved, live sanctified, get water baptized, and filled with the Holy Ghost. So he tells Philip, hey, there's some water right there. Why can't I get baptized now? Let me tell you what that tells me. That tells me he really got saved. Because when you really get saved, you want to be water baptized. Brother Harris, I, I ain't never been water baptized. Well, you might not be saved. Because I got born again. That's one of the first things I wanted to do was go down to the river. Somebody say amen. Hey, folks, I went to Turkey Creek in December and got baptized. Now, you got to be from Alabama and around the Birmingham area to understand Turkey Creek. Hey, it's cold. It's ice cold in the summertime. Preacher said, boy, it's going to be freezing. I said, I don't care. Will you please go baptize me? He said, if you want to be baptized that bad, yeah, let's go. And me and a car, little brothers got in the car, went to Turkey Creek, jumped out in the middle of the night. We turned the car down toward the creek, walked off into that icy water, and I'm here to tell you my teeth was like a machine gun. Preacher's mouth like a machine gun. 
He said, you sure you want to do this? I said, yes, I do. We got out there about waist deep. And, you know, they say, well, you know, once you get in the water, in a little while, it gets <laughs> No, not in Turkey Creek. In December, it don't. And he went through the religious form of properly baptizing me. I put my hand over my mouth. I grabbed my hand. He put his hand on my wrist. And he laid me down in that icy water. And when I went under the water, I'm telling you, I thought, I'm dead. <laughs> Spiritually, I was. That's what water baptism is, folks. It don't save you. You go out and publicly confess, I have died with Christ, and I have resurrected to a new life. When you come up, that's your resurrection. Like you've been re-resurrected with Jesus. You know, you're a new creature. Old man buried, new man up. Old man under the water, new man up. When you come up out of the water, you're supposed to be a new creature. So water baptism is an outward expression of an inward work of grace. And can I tell you, when I come up out of that icy December, Turkey Creek water, the glory, the glory. Everybody say glory. glory. The glory of God fell down on me. And that creek was not cold anymore. And I shouted, I shouted in the dark, in the creek. Preacher done let go of me. Couldn't, you couldn't hold on to me. I was shouting under the Holy Ghost, oblivious to where I was at. I knew I was in the power of God. And they said I shouted all over the creek. I shouted up out of the creek. I don't remember ever coming up out of the creek. But I do remember coming to out of the power of God on the bank. And they were throwing towels and blankets around me and saying, how do you feel? And I was still shouting, I feel wonderful. You said, Brother Harris, does that kind of power really exist today? It does. It does. And I'm fixing to show you it did here. I hadn't got something that the eunuch didn't get there in this story. Some of you, some of you, some of you hadn't read your lesson, and, and I'm fixing to break some good revelation to you. The eunuch said, there's water. Why can't I be baptized? Watch this. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Now, underline that. If you're really saved, if you really have accepted Jesus, then you may be water baptized. Get it? Hey, folks, y'all get that? Do you see that? And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Can I tell you, that's all you got to confess to be born again? Amen. Do y'all see the Holy Spirit and the Word confirming what I'm teaching you? Amen. That eunuch said, I do believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went both down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. Hold it now. Oh, hang on here. They did what? He didn't draw a bucket of water out and sprinkle him? Look here, I say this with love. Sprinkling is not a proper form of water baptism. Don't let, don't let some religious idiot deceive you. We're talking about a eunuch. We're talking about the treasurer of Ethiopia. He ain't no little guy here now. He had on his royal apparel. He was riding in a royal chariot. Folks, he had on his three-piece suit and his lizard skin shoes. And he didn't take them off. He said, there's water. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And they just both went down in that water. 
Get it? They went in the water. And I don't mean this to be mean, but I, you know, I hate religion. It deceives and blinds and, and, and so many people. We don't need religion. We need a relationship with Jesus. We need to believe like the eunuch. We need to be saying, I believe that Jesus Christ he is the Son of God. We got these Catholics throwing water on people. Methodists throwing water on people. And if you're a Catholic or a Methodist, I ain't mad at you. I'm mad at the system, the belief system that you're being deceived by. The Bible teaches consistently immersion. Immersion. They went down into the water. What's this? Strangest thing is going to happen here. And he baptized him. And when they, and when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. Watch this. Watch this, folks. That the eunuch saw him no more. And the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. That means he come up out of the water shouting too. He went on toward Ethiopia shouting and praising the Lord. But something happened here. The evangelist disappeared. The man that baptized him has disappeared. How did that happen? By the power of God. By the power of God, listen to me. If you need to disappear for the glory of Jesus, God can let you disappear. Amen. Say, preacher, you're crazy. I sure am. I'm crazy enough to believe that God can do anything he says. Yeah, yeah I'm that crazy. I believe that the Holy Ghost can take me and transport me, hallelujah, 30 to 50 miles, just like he does that evangelist, if he has to. Now, I'm not going to get out here and tempt God and say, all right, Jesus, beam me up. <laughs> I don't want that of you. Going out there saying, Brother Frank said, you going to Jesus, beam me up. But what happened here is a miracle that's hardly ever taught in churches, the Holy Ghost caught Philip up and transported him miles from Gaza. Now, some of you's looking. Brother Harris did say that. Well, we can we can read it again. And when they were come up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord <clears throat> caught away Philip. I mean, and the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. And the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. Somebody give God a hand clap. I'll read it all night. I'll read it all night. Because what happened was the Spirit of God caught him up and took him from that place and set him in another place. I'll prove that in just a minute. That ought to not really bedazzle or boggle your mind. Because any minute now, the Holy Ghost is going to take the whole church up out of this earth and carry us to heaven. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Don't you believe in the rapture? Don't you believe that the Holy Ghost can take you from earth to heaven? Amen. Sure you do. Sure you do. Then why do you scratch your head and say, does the Bible really say it picked him up and took him 30, 40 miles away? Because the Bible says it did. Listen to me, folks. Why does... God's Spirit allowed this to be put in the Scripture so you and I will believe God that nothing is impossible. 
The early church believed that nothing was impossible. Watch this. But Philip was found at Azotus. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Why did the Holy Ghost pick him up out of the desert place? Because he had to make some revival appointments. Listen to me. Please leave this service with the faith as the grain of a mustard seed to believe that our God can do anything. With God, nothing, nothing shall be impossible. Jesus said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible. 